everything old is new again. America's entertainment pop culture talk show. It may well possess a rudimentary intelligence. I'm trying to think, but nothing happens. Felt a great disturbance in the force. Hello, I'm Mr. Ray. Come on, Mark, like a dog for me. Where's the goodies? Leave the gun. Take the cannoli. I bet you wouldn't have done anything like this if Mom and Dad were here. You filthy criminal. Excuse me while I whip this out. Go ahead. Make my day. Here are your hosts, Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Well, I'm in this dark tunnel, and and there are other people in there with me, but I can't really see their faces. Is there a bright, beautiful light at the end of the tunnel? Yes. And the people, they, they seem like they're helping you, Todd? Uh-huh. Welcome to Everything Old is New Again. This is Douglas Viviani with the ever soulful David Cohen. Yes, and I'm very excited about today's show. Yeah, we, we're going to talk about something that uh, we've talked about before. We have a, a visitation from an individual that has been on our show before. Uh, we all experience a death in different forms. The question about what happens after we die is as old as time itself. The Egyptians built pyramids to ensure life after death for the pharaohs, right? The Bible promises a new life after we die, and humans have been creating art and of all form of cave dwellings, paintings created in the Italian Renaissance, and volumes of literature, and now movies, of course, in our day, have been made which explore this universal topic. Uh, today we're excited to once again host a man who will be able to provide us an answer as to what happens after we die, That's David. That's right. Well, since suffering a near-fatal illness at the age of six, George Anderson, who's sitting right next to me, really cool, <laughs> has had a special relationship with the souls in the hereafter who depend on his ability to bring peace and comfort to their grieving families. George has conducted more than 35,000 sessions and is the most scientifically tested medium in the world. In 1982, he became the first medium to appear in a weekly television series, uh, Psychic Channels. And in 1987, his book, We Don't Die, became the first bestseller by a medium. His books have sold more than a million copies worldwide. George is referenced in more than 60 books and has been filmed for dozens of television shows, including his own primetime network special, Contact, Talking to the Dead. He continues to work with people from all over the world, and he's working with us today right here. <laughs> Welcome, Welcome, George Anderson. George. Thank you kindly. Thank you, gentlemen. It, it's um, a pleasure, and uh, since the last time uh, we had you on the air, we've had quite a nice response, and uh, I researched a little bit, and behind your back, I saw that I, one of your movies that you kind of relate to, I think, is Resurrection, a 1980 movie with Ellen Bernstein, and we just heard that, a little clip about that. Am I right or wrong on that? <laughs> yeah, it. Um, I happen to um, come across the movie one time when it was on, I think, HBO or something, uh, you know, before the days of VHS and such. And I remember um, when she supposedly passes on in the vehicle tragedy with her husband and... At first I thought, you know, is this going to be something hokey? And then I realized it wasn't. You know, watching her going into the light and so forth, I remember thinking to myself, gee, that feels like that's happened before. Like it isn't the first time. And they actually handled uh, the production very respectfully and brilliantly. And then, of course, as many... As you know, and as many listeners will know, that you know, she returns and she has this incredible capacity to heal. And I remember years ago um, on the WBAB days that there was a parapsychologist who was there, Dr. Stephen Kaplan. He's passed away now, but he used to ask me if... I felt I was able to do healings. And of course, I didn't think so. And he was always curious, is it possible you could, you know, if he figured, if he, he says, if you have such an enormous amount of this energy, if only you knew how to like narrow it into that, you know, could it, you know, be done? And, you know, um, I've tried, you know, things such as that in the past. Uh, the only instance I can recall 
you know, uh, to borrow a line from the movie The Song of Bernadette where the where the bishop says, you know, a healing must be as sudden as a bolt of lightning. It has to be from one moment to the next, and I agree. It can't be, you know, five days from now you'll feel better. But there was a woman who uh, had contacted me years ago, and um, her son was constantly having trouble with headaches, and no matter what, they couldn't find out what was causing the pain. And, you know, and there was days he probably was ready to rip his head off. And um, and I said to her, you know, I don't have a good track record. But, you know, I'm, I'm, he was only, I think, eight or nine at the time. I said, you know, I'll do what I can. I'll make take a shot at it anyway. And I said, you know, however, you know, you must, as the parents, stay present in the room You know, so you see everything going on. And the only thing I recall is um, when, you know, I had him sit near me and when I put his hands, my hands, I mean, on his head. And uh, I remember I was told to visualize I was seeing snow on fire. Hmm. which was an interesting visualization, if I can get that out. (laughs) Um, But in any case, and I, you know, applied my hands and I kept visualizing that and he claimed the pain went away. And I have to admit, me being skeptical about it, kind of looked at him like, okay, whatever. And he said, no, the pain went away. It did manage to stay away for about a week. And then it came back again, and I did it again, and they said it stayed away until eventually it, um, you know, didn't return. Now, uh, you know, again, me being – I'm not a cynic, but I would consider myself a skeptic even of my own ability because there's no real concrete scientific proof of anything. And the reason I say I'm skeptical, but not a cynic. To me, a cynic throws out the baby with the bathwater. They've already made up their mind. Look, this is horse manure, and that's the end of it. Okay. The skeptic basically states being skeptical to me means I just don't know. But... um I'm skeptical about UFOs. I'm skeptical about Bigfoot just to bring some other things in. But I don't want to be cynical because we don't have proof of a definite nature and we don't have proof that it doesn't exist. So, um, you know, there's people out there, people listening, I'm sure, who, um, you know, then you get you know, the religious people who, you know, the Bible, this Bible, that, you know, I try, I'm not a fundamentalist. So that throws that out the window. Um, but I think keeping an open mind to everything is a reasonable and I feel personally an intelligent way to be. I mean, when you think back for centuries they had thought Pompeii was a myth Hmm. and Herculaneum, that these were myths of the ancient times. And of course, now we know for a fact that they did exist, except that they were buried in the ash of the volcano. Speaking of not believing, I can't believe our time with George Anderson has gone so fast. This first uh, section of our show on Everything Old is New Again will be back right after this. By the way, you can catch George Anderson if you live in California, San Diego, Los Angeles, Fresno, San Francisco, August 18th to the 28th. Don't miss the opportunity to see uh, George Anderson live. Go to georgeanderson.com to find out more information. We'll be back right after this. Now, back to America's entertainment pop culture talk show, Everything Old is New Again, with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Grandma comes to visit me sometimes. She said you came to the place where they buried her. Asked her a question. She said the answer is every day. What did you ask? Do I make her proud? 
Welcome. Everything old is new again. We're hopefully, uh, hopefully, we're making you proud for listening to us. We have here with us today, uh, of course, the ever soulful David Cohen with Douglas Viviani. We're joined by George Anderson, who we can say is a psychic medium, would be uh, one way or a quick a shorthand for what he does. And uh, we want to thank him for his time. Uh, my uh, initial uh, discussion here is I, I want to talk about some things about what you do. But before we do, I want to let everyone know that, especially in our listening areas in these areas that George will be conducting a keynote address launching the first ever Helping Patients Heal National Convention in Scottsdale, Arizona. That'll be in April 2018. Maybe we'll have George back to a little closer to that day, but sure. certainly uh, put that in your calendar. And in fact, if you want to get the more information, uh, the conference is April 13th to the 15th. George will be speaking on the 13th, signing copies of his latest book, uh, Life Between Heaven and Earth, which we spoke about on our last show. If you want to look that up, you can find it on everything old is new again dot biz. It's it's there on the podcast for if you've missed our show. Uh, and oh, certainly uh, George will be doing a number of private sessions April 14th and 15th. So if you want to find out about that, uh, go to helping parents heal dot org, which we'll talk about in a moment uh, to book a session for the weekend. You got to contact uh, or you can contact George at info at George Anderson dot com or I'll throw a phone number out there. Six three one three five one two nine seven two. I'll get your pens out. Six three one three five one two nine seven two. So, what happens at the particular conference we're talking about here, where you're helping um, apparently bereaved parents or children that have passed away? But uh, of course, before the parents have passed away, which is probably the most difficult, I think, painful thing that I could possibly imagine happening to a parent. So what uh, do you feel uh, you can add to that discussion and or will add at, at that convention? Well, at that convention, you know, I'll, I'll certainly take a few moments to talk about experiences I've had and so forth. And then I go into the audience randomly to see if, which is always the case, somebody's loved one will show up and start the ball rolling, as I say. But I, I try to impress upon people that I really have come to the realization, first of all, the ability doesn't work for me personally, unfortunately. Um if a friend of mine has lost a loved one, I can get a message from that loved one. And, you know, because they know I'm not a it's not like I I'm eating a salami sandwich, you know, someplace. And somebody comes to me and says, oh, go over and say that to that person. And, you know, to me, that would just be silly. But when the the soul will come through, they usually will come through with their name, you know, the circumstances, so you clearly can identify. The thing is, it's, again, I'm a receiver. You know, I hear from them. It's not me conjuring or anything of that nature. I hear from them. They do it their way. And I try to impress upon people that you know do come for sessions if you're thinking it's going to go the way you would like it to big mistake it's going to go the way they want it to certainly doesn't work the way i think it should which you know of course which is probably unfair makes me very skeptical about it because it doesn't work the way i think it should um but i'm strictly a receiver it's not that you know, I can say, oh, your dad's here. And what did you want to know? You want to know what mom's apple pie recipe was? It's horse manure. Um, if that be the case, I should be able to ask them, okay, give me the winning mega numbers for this week. Right, right, and right. nobody would ever hear from me. I'd be living off that. <laughs> but it doesn't work that way. It works the way it works. And it can be... Uh, not to singularize myself, but it can be very difficult for me to, you know, accept it because of that. You know, sometimes I hold things back. But the one thing that fascinates me is I think it's pretty much a scientific fact that every brain cell holds a memory. And the thing that I find fascinating is what they do from over, you know, from the hereafter. 
how do they know to get in my brain and find, like going through a file cabinet and find that file that relates to the situation? And then I want to kick myself in the pants when I keep it to myself a whole back. For example, I was thinking of a session I had done not too long ago. Now, the two people who were the subjects, one was not English speaking, but I mean, I'm not a linguist, but I certainly have heard Spanish in my lifetime. And the son was bilingual. He was speaking Spanish. So you figure, of course, they came from, uh, you know, that they're from a Spanish-speaking country. I could tell they weren't Americans. I mean, common sense. And I remember as the session was progressing, I kept seeing scenes out of this movie that I had watched several times. Um, I might be off on the title. It's, It's entitled Triumph of the Spirit or something like that. Um, but it, it was on DVD and I had purchased it from when I had viewed it because it was very good. And, What takes place in the movie, it's a true story about a Greek family of Jewish roots that, after the invasion, are sent to Auschwitz. And so I started seeing scenes out of the movie, and I'm saying, what the hell does this have to do with anything? You know, you just can't assume because somebody speaks Spanish, they're Catholic. And that's what I was thinking. That's what your normal brain tells you. So I said, why am I seeing these scenes? And I didn't say anything. And the people that had been arrested, you know, the family that had been arrested, among others in Greece, lived in Salonika. And that kept coming up to me, you know, that they came from Salonika and all. So um, didn't say anything. But found out, you know, other information came through that, I said, some, you know, somebody over there was telling me, you know, just don't make an assumption because you're hearing Spanish. Not everybody's Catholic. And actually saw the Star of David, realized that they were of Jewish roots. And somebody over there explained that they had, after, not long after the Nazi invasion, they had managed to get out of Greece and got into a country in South America and set roots there and built their family up. And the one thing I was so ticked off at myself about is because they kept showing me the scene of the movie where the family came from Salonika in Greece. And I held back, and that's where this person's family came from. And then, of course, you can't say, you know, because I did, I normally don't, you know, ask people, but I just was curious because of the, you know, what happened in the film. And I, and, you know, the, the son told me that the family had originated in Salonika. It's too late, as far as I'm concerned, to say, oh, I saw that and I just right, didn't right, say it. Right. Because if somebody did that to me, I'd say, you know, mm-hmm. you're a jerk. But um, the thing that fascinates me, and I'm really hoping one of these days a serious neurologist or brain doctor uh, wants me to be the guinea pig to do some experiments. How did, now I never saw these people from Adam, but how did their family know to go in my brain and find the information in that movie? That's where I think the link is. Speaking of links, how about this for a segue? You can go to georgeanderson.com and click on the links there. Find out more about his live appearances, more about his book tour, more about getting readings over the telephone or in person. georgeanderson.com. This is Everything Old is New Again. We're having some fun talking and exploring about life after death and how uh, George speaks to those who have passed, how it all works. We'll be back right after this on Everything Old is New Again. You're listening to Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. And we're here with George Anderson on Everything Old is New Again, enjoying a discussion about life after death. George, what if there's uh, someone that comes to you uh, from beyond that was speaking another language? How do you handle that? What's that all about? Now, for example, 
if somebody comes through speaking a language naturally I don't have a clue about or have never heard before. I'll just say I'm hearing another language because it was hysterical in uh, a group one night. I said, you know, to somebody that people from your family seem to be speaking other than English. And I guess the subject thought he was being a wise guy. But he said to me, he says, oh, well, anybody could say that everybody's family spoke another language before they came to the U.S., I said, you know, I looked at him. I said, are you kidding me? You couldn't say it to me. Let's look at, listen to my waspy name, right. including my middle name, George right. Pennington Anderson II. <laughs> there can be no question that everybody spoke English. So it isn't something you can say to everybody. But if it is a language I've never heard before, all I'll say is I'm hearing something other than English, but I can't make out what it is and but it's not, an, it's not an important issue. But it always fascinates me that the souls have the ability to get in my head and find something, maybe not right off the bat. And many times I can overlook it. I had a session with a woman via phone a few weeks ago, and the son kept, she had lost her son. Her son had came through of his, you know, no volunteering of any information he said that this was his mother i was speaking to and he said he wanted to make sure she knew he didn't suffer at the time of passing and right after i said this and i made sure she understood this has nothing to do with religion but i saw saint joseph appear now in me going to real catholic school in its day um saint joseph is the patron of a happy death so he his the saint's appearance came right after the woman's son said he didn't suffer the time of passing so i said oh so your son is probably also trying to signal me, you know, giving me the confirmation that he didn't suffer at the time of passing, which he was very relieved to hear. Now, I said to her, you know, he's telling me this, but he's definitely giving me depth with. He's not just saying it because, oh, every parent wants to hear that. And she said, no, she understood. I said, okay, that's all I have to know. But I stupidly overlooked that the saint appeared again, and I said in my mind, well, you already explained what you're showing up for, so what are you showing up for again? I already got it. But the son's name was Joseph. And I don't, like a dope, overlooked it, you That's know? Me, yeah. I mean, it's, they're, you know, showing me right in front of my face, and I'm thinking, oh, well, this has been taken care of, so the brain dismisses it. So now, at these uh, bereavement sessions, I guess what you, also, in, in a way you could say is that the idea that you might be able to do a reading or two and show some evidence, if you will, sure. of the fact that there is life after death by uh, coming up with names and uh, ways that people passed away, maybe, uh, or some connection to a person that maybe that would lend to uh, some faith on their behalf or helping them with their yes. faith to to understand that their child has passed away is still a life and still maybe overlooking their lives here the, the parents but also that you know death is not the end of it all and maybe that gives them a little bit of uh of peace of mind too i guess we'd say right certainly it would the uh the full approach is to give them a comfort or reassurance i mean the bottom line is we still want them here physically right that's never going to change that's we're physical beings that's what we relate to but Many times, now the worst tragedy for the parent is the parent who loses a child through suicide. I've got a little bit of a bug up my rear end about um, the S word mm -hmm. <laughs> because we've been, well, especially as uh, somebody who's brought up old time Catholic, you know, you committed suicide, you go to hell, you know, I really have had parents come to me who have said, where they feel they have nowhere else to turn. They turn to their church as such, and, you know, the priest says, oh, you, you know, your son or daughter is suffering in purgatory or in hell or whatever. And I always say to them, well, that to me is horse manure. Because, first of all, if we're capable of compassion and understanding, as I said, right in sessions, I certainly expect them over there to be doubly capable of compassion and understanding. And if they ain't, I quit. Right. That's right. the end of the story. But it can be, you know, as I try to, uh, you know, we'll come through for the parents. You know, no one knows what nightmares were going through this individual's head prior 
to the tragedy. My feeling is that I never like to say that they passed on from taking their own life. I say to the parents, your child passed on from illness. And that illness is depression and anxiety. They are definitely illnesses, mental and emotional. Doesn't mean you're ready for Pilgrim State down the road, but you know, they're illnesses. Can they kill you? You're darn right they can. Because unlike a physical ailment, which you may know is causing the pain, mental and emotional can come and go. You know, souls have said it was when they were here on the earth, it was like a roller coaster ride. One day they could feel they're on top of the world, next day they're down for the count. So I always say to the parents, think that your child passed from a health condition of the emotional and mental nature, not that to use the S word. But there are times that you have uh, been able to uh, communicate with the person that committed, uh, or, you know, the S word. So yeah, the S word. Uh, sure. <laughs> and, and, uh, and that unto itself, I would think, would be some kind of, uh, again, evidence or some kind of feeling that wherever they are, they might be learning a lesson from that. They might be, uh, you know, trying to experience uh, the, the full impact of what they did. But it doesn't mean they're gone. It doesn't mean they're in some fire pit somewhere. Right, exactly. They're, they're struggling as they did on Earth. Maybe they learned a lesson. Maybe they're struggling a little bit uh, where they are. But they're there, and they're experiencing their journey uh, continued after. After, after this plane, I guess. I have realized that when an individual does, and I certainly would not encourage it because the other side doesn't encourage it, when an individual does reach the breaking point where they contribute to ending their life, I've never heard any of them saying, you know, I was sent to hell or I'm burning over here or whatever. Um, many of them have stated that they came to the realization, okay, this wasn't the smartest thing to do. But you have to also take into consideration, if you're not in the right frame of mind, you're not going to act rationally. But many of them, which I always have found very comforting, claim that when they arrive there, whether it be pets that were part of the family or just in general, animals come to welcome them. Uh, maybe not members of the family right away. But then again, it makes more sense because what do animals do? They instantly put you at ease. Their presence is very soothing and therapeutic, safe, loving. And they have claimed that they've followed the animals into the light and they take them, the animals take them to what we would consider like a high class rest home. And sometimes they'll say the animals like go to take a nap. And they get the hint, okay, maybe I should rest for a while because um, definitely the illness of depression and anxiety can, um, can rattle them spiritually as well. So this becomes a tremendous comfort for them. Great. Uh, we're going to be back with George uh, Anderson in a few minutes and, and uh, want to uh, dive into maybe a little bit more about what it's like after we go from Earth. Uh, certainly, if you want to look up any events that he has and many of his books, they're on Amazon.com. Certainly, you can go to GeorgeAnderson.com and uh, all the information's there to uh, dive into this fascinating subject. We will be back on Everything Old is New again right after this. Now, back to America's Entertainment Pop Culture Talk Show. Everything old is new again with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Hey, it's Dr. Peter Weller. I'm here with my friends David Cohen and Douglas Viviani on Everything Old is New Again. One of my favorite shows. And I may, I may not be the most interesting man in the world, but I'm one of them. Aha, this is Douglas Viviani, one of the other most interesting men in the world. I say that facetiously. Uh, we're here with David Cohen and, of course, George Anderson, psychic medium, who is uh, in enlightening us a little bit about uh, his abilities, how they affect us here, what uh, they mean in terms of life after death. He's going to be doing 
some seminars that he just announced in San Diego on August 18th. Uh, I actually should say they're live events. I don't know if they would say seminar, I guess. Yeah, same thing. Li- live events. Okay, sure. uh, San Diego, August uh, 18th. Los Angeles, August 20th. Fresno, August 24th. San Francisco, August 28th. You'll be also holding seminars and doing readings uh, of several off, uh, audience members during these events and uh, signing copies of your book, the most recent of which is Life Between Heaven and Earth. There are certainly other ones uh, that I recommend. I've read them all. They're, they're great reads. Uh, and again, if you want to take a look and see uh, what's happening in the world of George Anderson, very simple, georgeanderson.com. Uh, George, I, I had, had we all have had people pass away. I've had someone pass away recently uh, that uh, was Don't very volunteer close. any information. No. Excuse oh, no, me I'm not even going to. But my, my, <laughs> point, my question is now, I sometimes wonder if they're, they knew I was doing this, for example, and it was, it's, you know, being on the radio and I enjoy it and all. Are they in some way, uh, do they ever watch what's going on? Are they uh, uh, isolated wherever they are? Do, do they come share your life with you still when they're gone? Does that make any sense? Many of our loved ones from the hereafter will state that they, of their own cho- choice, are around as very much like a guardian angel to help us to help ourselves but they make it singularly clear they don't wave a magic wand over there and make things go the way we would like I've had many a late night argument with them in my own home because again things not going the way that I may think it should be going one thing I do like about the souls when they come in they don't come through to convert anybody because they know Ultimately, we have to learn it for ourselves. They can tell us about, you know, the joyful reunion over there with people have gone on ahead or pets or whatever. But ultimately, we won't know until we experience it for ourselves, Um, which does help in my case to make it more believable um it certainly does not in many ways seem to you know their existence over there doesn't seem to follow a very rigid path of any faith or belief system here everything is up to us just as it is here you know it's up to us you know to find joy or happiness i've had people say oh i wish i could have made my husband happier when he was here but it's not your job he has to make himself happy you have to recognize you're always in the driver's seat you certainly can pray and ask them to help you to help yourself but again it's not santa claus They don't do it, you know, the way you may feel that it should be done. And for many people, that can cause doubt and cynicism about a hereafter because, you know, people here seem to many times think, even I have at times, I'm sure, think we have it all figured out and we haven't even hit the tip of the iceberg. One thing I found fascinating is souls over there that we may hold up here in high esteem. They don't look very highly on them over there. Uh, For example, somebody like Tchaikovsky is held in high esteem over there, but that's because he left such a fantastic testimonial here. His music still, and one of my favorite composers, his music still illuminating people and making you feel good. We celebrate Columbus Day. They don't think he was such a great guy over there. Mm-hmm. And I was curious as to why, and they said when you look upon him, he was a slave driver. Right. He dealt in slavery. Um So somebody like Mozart, as much as you see in the film Amadeus, he's kind of a little bit of a wacky type of guy. But his brilliance and his talent has left its impression here forever. That, I think, makes more sense. That the people who do go out of their way to do something here as part of their spiritual experience are the ones that they will hold up in high esteem over there because every 
one thing, especially people listening, have to realize, especially if you don't have a good opinion about yourself, everybody, according to the hereafter, is unique in their own way. Just because you may look at the Joneses' property and their grass is greener, okay, but you still are your own unique individual on your own unique individual experience. That's basically what it's all about. Not everybody's going to be, you know, a nationally known celebrity. So many individuals that have done you know, tremendous things here. As the other side always says, which I like one of their mottos, the simplest things turn out to be the most profound. That really is nice where, you know, someone's mom comes through and says, thank you for being so good to me prior to my passing. And, you know, the subject may say, you know, under their breath, oh, I wish I could have done more, but they don't expect you to do more. They know that you're capable of what you're capable of. And many times, too, they say it's all right to recognize that there was nothing you could do for me health-wise if they were passing from a health condition. Your hands were tied. and But that doesn't mean that in their eyes you didn't do the best you could. You know, that's all that is of the most importance. Okay. Now, so in, in essence, when a, pass, a loved one passes away, uh, if they choose to be, then they can be uh, an overseer of your life or a guardian angel, whatever mm -hmm. the word might be. But like you said, they're not going to be Santa Claus. You've got to do your own thing. Sure. Uh, uh, that's uh, comforting at some level if they choose to be here. But if they don't, do you have any clue as to what is their day like? What are they doing over there? Do you know? Well, some souls have come through, which, you know, naturally I'll perk up to this that have chosen to work with animals over there and still will visit this dimension to um, help animals in need here. Even the animal can be on their own unique experience. For example, uh, one of the cats that I had adopted from the local shelter, after one of my cats had passed away and I decided to get another animal, another cat, um, I had gone to a few of the shelters around here, and I'll be honest with you, nothing grabbed me. So I had gone to one of the local shelters, and I didn't want a kitten, I wanted a cat. I walked in, and this cute little apricot and white cat walked up to me and I walked up, up to her and I'll never forget our eyes locked and she stopped and I stopped and I heard a voice inside me say oh my gosh it's so nice to see you again and naturally I she was one I took home but the thing is I had heard that she had been had been like a adopted as a foster pet by different families and they had always ended up bringing her back and I couldn't understand why you know she's a delight but then one night I was talking to her as she was laying in bed with me and I said I know why you kept being brought back because you were looking for me and I was looking for you and our paths hadn't crossed yet until that moment. Well, how about that? Well, we are happy that the time has come for you to cross paths with us on Everything Old is New Again. George Anderson, thank you very much for your time this week. We will be looking forward to having you back next week on Everything Old is New Again. In the meantime, if you're looking for some information about uh, George Anderson, his books, and his tour, go to georgeanderson.com, georgeanderson.com. We are Everything Old is New Again. We'll be back next week.